And unfortunately, 76% of those inputs are actually classified as highly hazardous. So there's a real concern, you know, that this report is actually showing that, you know, our staple foods, you know, are actually being doused with a lot of poison that is not necessary. Oh, okay. <laughs> Shall I first or you? No, no, go ahead. Okay. So when we say inputs, poisons, in what form do they then come in contact with the food? when it's being grown at the points of what what happens what's going on so it's in different forms uh one uh sometimes it's actually being grown because some of these um inputs are actually put on the seed say for example when you go and buy seed uh, from the agrovet maybe you're buying your seed uh, of maize or beans it's normally has a fungicide or you know some chemicals like a put on the seed to or pesticides uh. to keep away the pests okay. you know sorry a pesticide so okay. basically when you uh, when you plant it already the seed already is coated in pesticide and then now when the farmer is uh, you know growing the food they normally would have some different challenges so they would have uh, maybe pests, you know, that are going to, um, uh, that affect the crops, you know, or maybe they need to uh, get rid of the weeds. So they normally would spray a herbicide or they need to manage, you know, some diseases. So they would use a fungicide. Mm. <coughs> so what happens is, you know, all the way from when you're planting the seed to when it's going to the market, it's okay. being doused in a lot of chemicals. Let me ask this question. It appears to me... Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have a crop. Mm -hmm. We have grain. Yes. To keep it safe, we coat it with, what did you call it? Uh, with some pesticides. Uh, pesticide. Yeah. Okay. So mm -hmm. then when we plant it, yeah. then what do we do again? Now after, we add. So now after three weeks of, of planting, mm -hmm. you're going to have a lot of weeds. Okay, so we so use you spray a herbicide. A herbicide. Yes. Now mm. to get rid of the weeds. Not a weedicide. Herbicide. No. <laughs> herbicide. Okay. Herbicide. So you today. Spray? Yes. Okay. Herbicide. So you spray a herbicide. Yes. And, and then, then after. After uh -huh. about four or five weeks, you're going to start noticing some doodos or some issues with your crops. You know, they have some insects so, here and there. Then you spray a pesticide. But then. I, I thought the herbicide. What is the herbicide supposed to do? Herbicide Kill the is weeds. weeds. Kill the weeds. It's it a, is a weed. Weed, yeah. weed killer. And then, so when we see the doodos, now we spray something to kill the doodos. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Now you have to spray again a All pesticide. Right. I um. And remember, disease. We've not got to the disease part. Okay. So for disease, what do we spray? You, you you spray fungicide. Okay, you we have, spray fungicide. Yeah. Now when you have bacterial problems okay. or whatever, All right. All right. now you spray fungicide. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to suspend my thoughts on the subject for the moment, but I'm going to ask this question. Yeah. So before fungicide, herbicide, <laughs> pesticide, pesticide, we decide. Yes. Before all these sides came into being, yeah. people had crops. Exactly. What did they do? Because they harvested. Yes. They yeah. ate. We ate we exactly. Not die. Yeah. 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 What did they do beyond just drying these things? What did they do? They were just growing food as nature intended. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Were weeds there? Yes. 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 Were, were pests pulling, there? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, these mm -hmm. weeds and pests also play a role. Exactly. And it's not all negative, is it? No. Nope. No. Nope. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, essentially, what I've just heard mm -hmm. is that there is a business yes, somewhere. Yes, of course. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Who have guaranteed they will stay in business. Exactly. Okay. Mm. They offer you a protection which then requires another protection. Exactly. And which requires another protection and which requires another protection. Mm -hmm. So, you have this chain yeah. of additives that you're always being told are necessary. Yeah. And then now we're being told these things are actually poison. And then somebody else is going to come and say, okay, now for that poison which we brought to you in this form, yeah. we have something else that can help solve the problem. And sometimes it's the same person who is actually going to poison you your whole life, then you're going to fall sick and still give them money so that you can Yes, because they have a cousin who yes, is part exactly. of the business yeah. who now has the medicine mm -hmm. that you require. Yeah. So when you hear there's an increase in this disease and that disease and the other disease, so and many of them are being caused by these very same things that we're discussing. Mm. Okay, so where are these things manufactured? Let Harun tell us. <laughs> in fact, I just want to. <laughs> you guys. I want to come in. I want to come in here, and uh, you you have brought a very good narrative yeah. whereby we cannot just despise in totality mm -hmm. the the interrelationship within a farming system of all these kind of. Uh, uh, what we call pests, what mm. we call weeds, weeds disease. because um, there is that kind of synergy, a synergistic relationship 
between the soil and the crops and this diversity species that we see of both insects and on the plants. Mm. What we are saying is that when we think about industrial farming, industrial farming, our aim or the aim has been just the element of increased production. But we want to put here, uh, and this to go in record, that when we are thinking about food production and food security in this country, it's not just about the amount of food we get. We should also be thinking about both safety and also the, 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 what we call the nutrient-dense food. We want to get food that is dense in its nutritive value. So, looking at this element, what Sylvia has brought is a very good concept. From the stage of planting to the stage of managing the crop and also post-harvest, let's look at the whole of that value chain and ask ourselves, are we, are we going for food that is dense when it comes to nutritive value or we are just producing food that might be empty in quotes in terms of its nutrients. What would be your answer from now, what you've seen? Now, of what I'm saying is this, that when you do this kind of intercropping, when you, you can manage even this weed by bringing other crops, or you can manage this insect by bringing other crops that are beneficial to us. Let me give you a, a very nice example. I used to see my, in my village an, a neighbor who was a very old lady. She, was, she used to intercrop uh, um, onions mm -hmm. and she will not remove what we call the Mexican marigold, called it mofangi, mm -hmm. because these are repellents mm -hmm. for the insects that feed on those crops. So, so the see, weed was the repellent. Was the repellent. You get. But when we, we were taught the element of, of uh, large scale farming in quotes, because even small scale farmers now have adopted some of this mechanism, is we have dropped in totality that kind of intercropping or miscropping. And that's what we are promoting, just to answer your question, do. Mm -hmm. The element, what we do, what we do. We are calling, what we are calling for is integrated pest management. And we go for, we are not going for control. We are going for management. But my, uh, so I would ask, why did we see the massive drop of using these weeds which serve as let me they call weeds or other plants mm. that serve as insect repellents mm. knowing full well their benefit yes why was that dropped was that let me to before sylvia comes because she has got a very good narrative i've been listening to her she can explain that very well mm. because she's she's practicing it mm. but i want to put it this way that when we embraced in totality and we are shown that ours is bad industrial farming practices are good. Mm. And this also comes from even our education. We, what we are trained, the curriculum that we get in our university mm. need to be changed to embrace, to embrace our indigenous farming practices. Mm. That I saw this grandmother doing integrating onions, um, integrating um, Mexican, Mexican marigold, mofangi, and other crops. You could see doricals throughout the year, sweet potato. This kind of integration also enhances diversity of food. You know, when we are looking at the element of en ensuring the right to food, mm. we are looking at that diversity. We are looking at the element of intercropping. And now just to, to, to also to answer your question, what we need to do. We are saying, let the synthetic pesticides or when we, inter we use pesticides be the last result mm. you get mm -hmm. and we are talking about what we call the integrated pest management that br brings about our indigenous farming practices that that discourages monocropping that promotes intercropping mixed cropping mm -hmm. use of biopesticides the fermented um, um, um cautions that we get from our farmers mm -hmm. and that calls for what we are saying, control. You are, you, you are not, I mean, management. Mm -hmm. You are managing this element of pest, but not always controlling with pesticides. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, Sylvia, why? And how can this work today? And can it work um, large scale when you talk about then using what you would find in nature to eventually do what mm. the synthetic um, elements do? 
Yeah, so basically, I mean, we always get the question, can organic feed the world? But I always uh, ask, has conventional farming fed us? It's not been able to feed us. It has actually degraded our soils. It has made us sick. And I'm not saying that it's all bad, but I just find that, you know, we have to look for balances in which we can actually be able to make sure that we can grow, um, you know, uh, large-scale, organic, safe produce. And this is possible, you know. Like one of the things I always say is mm. that, you know, first start working, okay, uh, First, wait, let me go back a little. Mm. Statistics show that 80% of all the food we consume is from smallholder farmers. Mm. It's not the large-scale farmers who are right. feeding us. Mm. It's the smallholder. farmers normally produce for export. Mm. Exactly. And for business. Yeah. Yes. So the smallholder farmers are feeding us. So why do we say that then organic or sustainable farming or using agroecology is not able to feed us? It means that we're not able to reach the farmers. And one of the recommendations in the toxic uh, business report is that farmers don't have access to knowledge. We are not, you know, like we are not informing them. Because when the pesticides came in, it looked like the new, uh, improved, better way to farm. And it made it look like, okay, fine, why do you have to struggle, you know, uh, like keeping banana peels and leaves rotting the whole month? to get compost, mm-hmm. and yet you have some little pellets that you can just drop into the soil, mm. and they're going to give you all the fertility that you need. So it looked like the improved way of farming, and farmers ran to that, and they said, you know what, let's do this. 25, 30, 40 years, because, mm. you know, fertilizers were actually brought in actively, I think, in the early 80s. Mm-hmm. So 40 years later on, our soils are acidic. Like 80% of our soils in Kenya are acidic. They're not able to produce sure. enough food. Sure. Like, talk to anybody, you know, even now, Five, ten years ago, one acre of land was giving me this amount of produce. Mm. The produce has come down mm. considerably by like 70%. You know, they are producing now 30% what they were producing before. So basically... And it's because whatever it is, the nutrients in the soil have been eroded. Of mm. course. And now some farmers cannot grow anything without fertilizer. Must. That's why we're really uh, pushing. The health, the health That's of why the soil we are pushing. has been messed up. And the you've, you've the also killed the soil microbiology. Exactly. The microbiome, you know, he made a yep. point there, and mm. let me just mm. jump on that. Yes, yeah. please. He do. said that we're eating empty food. We really are. Yeah. Because you can actually have a carrot grown conventionally, but then if you're to get the vitamins and all the benefits of that carrot, you know, if you're to eat one that has been grown using safe uh, farming, you have to With eat practices. like 15 carrots mm-hmm. of the conventional to eat. To much one. Hmm. Okay. Yes. I'd like us to take a break at that point. Okay. Uh, at this point, rather. And then come back and see, okay, so, you know, in our minds that we hear these things, what then does it all mean in terms of moving forward? You can't really change what you've eaten in the past. I mean, that's... That's, that's gone. That's gone. Yeah. yeah. You can't even change what you've practiced as a farmer in the mm. past. Yeah. That also is yeah. gone. Yeah. With the present situation that we have, what then should we be looking towards doing? We're having a food conversation this hour. And uh, beyond that, in terms of practices, the best ones to be able to look forward to in terms of what we should do. It's 28 minutes after nine o'clock. We'll come back with Haran and Sylvia after this. This is The Situation Room, the only way to start your day. When you're impeached, you're impeached. When you're sentenced, you're sentenced. Madam Chief Justice. Until the sentence is uh, set aside. Ukibeba vitu kwa roho utakufa. If you carry things in your heart, you will die. <laughs> the reason for which you went to school yeah. and then got, you know, got that experience, yes. that reason must be paid for. Oh, right. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> This level. Ship up or ship out. Levels don't change. No, no. Yeah, it's about shipping ship. out. You know my business partner here. Yeah. Shipping out. Are we talking about the <laughs> ship in the bathtub? Or, <laughs> or the ship man? I want to tell him to tell us a story of knowing school. And they've been told to write a composition about a ship. His classmate raised a hand. Teacher, are you talking about a ship ship or a ship goat? <laughs> The Situation Room, Kenya's biggest conversation.
some very nice Machua music. It really took me back to my days and I can just feel ya again and enjoy the vibes. Spice. I'm a good listener of Spice FM. You play the best music. This is 94.4 Spice FM. Indeed, it's all about hashtag Spice Drive. Do you have a domestic in your house? Don't I to women. I have cramps and old women. That's why my name is normally comes weekend when my madam is around. Are you saying your house is <laughs> a temptation? I think so. I knew that. Tune in to The Spice Drive with me, Edward Quatch, 3 to 7 in the PM. The Spice Drive, only on 94.4 Spice FM, Nairobi. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Nine minutes. Judicial dialogue on transnational organized crime and illicit financial flows is into its second day today. It started yesterday and it goes on till tomorrow. It's focusing on the role of courts in the prevention and response to transnational organized crimes and illicit financial flows. It was opened yesterday by the Chief Justice Martha Kome, and 21 African countries are represented by their judges to discuss experiences, challenges, and potential solutions to the adjudication of different forms of these crimes. And uh, uh, they'll be live. They've been live on TV and online, and you can catch those proceedings today and into tomorrow. Haran and Sylvia are in the studio this morning, and we're having a conversation about food and how safe it is. As we got off onto the break, we're asking, okay, so the food that we are eating, um, or the food that's the food that's being grown, and the food that we are consuming, in terms of value, is is wanting. How do we know this? If I walk into I walk to the the market and I'm buying something. How do I pick up a carrot? Or how do I pick up a bunch of spinach and know, well, okay, this is lacking in the nutrients because of how it was grown. How how do you how do you do that? Good question. Mm. Now, um it's indeed a challenge because uh we need to appreciate that uh the food we have, the food we eat um, is uh, grown in a manner that is uh, healthy for consumption. So it's a, hard, it's a hard question to do it. But for example, like uh, the Sylvia basket, what Sylvia is doing, mm. she's able to aggregate uh, food that is uh, safe, food that has been grown organically, and she's able to meet the market and to meet the demand. So what I would say is that um, it, it's a transformative change whereby we will move on as a country to be able to, to embrace uh, food that has been grown in a very safe and sustainable manner that embraces the, the, the principles of agroecology, food that is, uh, th- food that, uh, is grown in a manner that we can all appreciate that it's safe. So for now, actually it's a challenge mm-hmm. because me and you will go to supermarket. We have no control measures on what you are going to buy in terms of quality, in terms of uh, safetyness uh, when it comes to health issues. So it's still a challenge. Mm. And this way we are saying that we need to create more awareness among our farmers and also look at uh, what incentivizes them to embrace uh, g- uh, growing of food that is safe in principle. Mm. Yeah. So we, Sylvia, we have you here, don't we? Yeah. yeah. Okay, now. <laughs> you. <laughs> I feel like you're going to put me on the spot here. Yes, I am. <laughs> uh, uh, He's already raised the knife. <laughs> I know. <laughs> no, I'm not, go- I'm not going to put you on the spot. I just sure. want to ask. Huh? Yeah, go ahead. When you produce safe food yeah. and someone asks you to provide evidence, as to the safety you claim yeah how do you respond to that yeah so basically uh we have systems and mechanisms because you know we can't just you know just have hearsay or just speak to it so we basically work with different organizations so we have different ways in which we can actually be able to make sure our food is certified as safe 
So one way that works very well for farmers is we normally uh, train the farmers through an organized uh, forum, uh, which is known as Kilimo High. Kilimo High means safe uh, organic produce. So we normally get groups of farmers, we train them for about two years, and then after that we take them through a group certification, which we call participatory guarantee systems, and we partner with different organizations. I know you've, uh, I think here in the hot seat, you've actually had someone from Koan, which is the Kenya Organic Agriculture Network. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we work very closely with them and different uh, um, um, like organization like H- Hendrich Ball, Pelham Kenya, we have different organizations. See, what I'm so, asking is, mm-hmm. how do we certify that when all these certified organizations have certified yeah. that what you're doing is organic? Exactly. If I were to get someone independent of all these groups, yeah. how do I guarantee that they will come up with the same results and say that, yes, indeed, mm. it is safe? Or are we saying that because these organizations who are known have said it is safe. So we must therefore assume no. and take it for granted that it is safe. No, we actually also have third party certification which we also use. So we actually have independent private people who are able to actually go out, meet the farmers and make sure that what they're doing is the right thing. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you find that you know you have to have you can't just stand up and speak. Okay. You actually do, must yeah. Do we have a national through. body like mm-hmm. say Kenya Bureau of Standards in yeah. the agricultural sector? that can play that oversight role in determining that these yeah. organic products are indeed organic yeah. and that they are indeed as nutritious as they claim. Because mm. without a watchdog body yeah. that sort of like speaks to the standards mm-hmm. and holds those who are in that particular market accountable yeah. to those standards, exactly. without it being there, good as what you're doing is, mm-hmm. there will always be rogue elements who come in to claim that their mm. produce mm. is good, yeah. They meet the standards and yet nothing could be further from the truth. Yeah, let me just say something there. And you know that's what I wanted just to mention. Like we have serious policy gaps. Serious policy gaps. Because you know, some of these things cannot be implemented unless we have a favorable policy environment. And what we have been doing and trying to work with the government is that we normally uh, we went to the Ministry of Agriculture and we asked them, you know, what uh, what do you have in place to make sure that even as a ministry, you're actually able to check on the safety of food? They sent us to Ministry of Health. <laughs> and Ministry of Health told us, now you're going to work with the uh, Department of Public Health. Mm. Now, when you go to Department of Public Health, when they say now they're giving the babies the polio, whatever, Vaccine. they're doing yeah, polio vaccines, they have so many other things, safe food is at the back of the list. And so it becomes a place where by now we only have to work with private institutions and which is not very sustainable Mm. and it's not able to actually affect and affect or like support the majority of farmers in the country. There's this organization called CALRO. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. The research institute. It used to be CARI, then there was Hilary, but now it's CALRO. Yeah. All right. They're a research organization. They are. They are the sort of institution that would have the wherewithal to do this thing that we are speaking of. Mm -hmm. Where do they come in? It's bureaucracy. They're nowhere. Because we've asked, but they still send us back to Ministry of Health and we have to go to public health. Because they say public health are the people who are in charge of the health of people. And then also, please note, we are dealing with double standards here. Because um, I think there was a bill, like there was a food safety bill uh, or policy that was actually passed, I think, if I'm not wrong, in 2021 by KEFIS. And the only reason KEFIS actually came up with that policy was because uh, the countries where we export to, especially in the EU, said that unless you have a food safety bill mm. that follows this uh uh, like recommendations or whatever, we will not import, import. Mm-hmm. food from Kenya anymore. So they did a bill specifically, a policy, a food mm-hmm. safety policy, specifically for export. So we went to Kefis and told them, well enough, good, you're doing it because mm-hmm. we're getting some market out there. What about us? They still sent us back to Ministry of Health, Public Policy. Mm-hmm. That's very interesting. Health. Yeah, Because I think about Cairo, well, and I it's think this, centers, is, yeah. this is the organization who have um, brilliant Mandate. minds and also have the mandate to provide this kind of information for the country. Yeah. This is the same organization that came up with the blight potato. 
the blight resistant and uh, drought resistant potato mm. this is the same organization who if you walk into the doors will tell you you know this is how you can make up feed for your animals and this is what you should be putting into them mm. this is the same organization who says the makeup of water in this area will not allow you to grow this crop grow this crop mm. so it befuddles me then that we have a situation whereby the food that we are consuming is not up to scratch mm. literally yeah. but that an organization which has the mandate to do this very same thing is not involved in the conversation let me let me come in there and say that um, personally i do appreciate the research that goes on at uh, the kenya agriculture research institute yeah but uh, because um if you look at the kind of scientists that in calro we have got highly trained and competent research researchers yes and also on uh, f- food nutrition they are there um what i would really really con- my concern is what silvia brought that as a country we need to embrace the element of um uh agroecology for example both principles and practice that will support the realization of safe food okay now um under the ministry of agriculture I'm glad that uh, we now have uh, the agroecology strategy that is being worked on. And what I would really, really request is that our policymakers, our politicians who we listen to need to be really embracing some of these initiatives that are going on at the technical level. Because we could be having a double speak whereby we at the technical level these issues are being done but they are not being amplified because we as the common one are in charge the grassroots we listen to our uh, political uh, uh, leaders at the grassroots level so how do they resonate our parliamentary because for example we have got the f- uh, food and uh, i think is a food and feed safety bill that is going on i think i don't know if it has been tabled i need to follow up on that but You see these are these are these these are initiatives that we need to look at, at under which lens hmm. are these bills looking at when they are being pushed are they promoting the practices and the principles that are going to help us to realize or are we at the tail end of the value chain for example you have a product you say i want to see how safe it is but have you looked at how it has been produced you know the role of politicians in this country is always a double edged sword yeah When you're talking about policies, politicians don't produce policies, them they make laws. Mm-hmm. Policies are made by experts and exactly. they and they tend to know what they're doing. Yeah. Now, politicians will speak to the policies that we are speaking of, but uh-huh. as I said, well, it's double edged. Yeah. There's what they think the masses want to hear. Want to hear. There's what they think will promote their own interest. Mm-hmm. And very rarely is it something that they're actually doing for the common good. Yeah. Mm. Now, what we're discussing here is something that is at the center and at the heart and center of our livelihood yeah heart and center absolutely okay? if one went to the ministry of agriculture you would find policy papers that speak to the very thing we're, we're talking about here mm-hmm. we have those in an abundance mm-hmm. there's no question about it mm-hmm. it's like we archive them for other people to come and take and borrow <laughs> and, 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 and implement and make success mm-hmm. out of the issue here is the silo mentality where Sylvia and her group go to the parent ministry of agriculture mm-hmm. and it's kicked the can is kicked down the road yeah. mm-hmm. and they end up in the ministry of health and I'm wondering <laughs> ministry of health do you have a situation where you go to the ministry of health and they take you to the ministry of agriculture to have a problem solved mm-hmm. you see yes they could when you're talking about public health you're talking about nutrition sure, sure. okay yeah you could yeah but then How is it that something that is this crucial mm. and something that is very very doable mm. with an organization that is at the heart of it and has done wonderful research work do you know that the grass or the hay that cows eat in Australia and Brazil that that very variety that is so much in demand was actually home grown and invented here that's yeah. the kind of science we have yeah so top so, notch so top th- notch this scientists. thing th- this thing we're speaking of where all we require is this scientist to tell us that look everything that has been said is verifiable because this is what we've done locally that's it mm. so that even when we have a stamp of approval from kebs we know that you know something 
this thing is actually safe. Not complicated. We, we are not importing the scientists. We are not importing the technology they need. We actually already have it. You see, th this is my, my concern. So you have the capacity to do it. It's not being done. That is really it. Even what Sylvia and her group are doing, look at the circuitous route they followed. Mm. Go here, go to Andrich, go to Ball, go to who? <laughs> you see? Go to agriculture, go to health. Uh, yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> and and I, need, I need just to, to, yes. to reinforce what you've said. Yes. And we have started seeing it, which I think is a positive mark. And we appreciate at Henrich Ball Foundation. You know, the yeah. PCPB is the regulatory body when it comes to issues of pesticides mm. and the related products. And uh, we have been pushing Who's for... the PCPB? So, sorry? The PCPB? The Poisons Board. Okay, there we go. Anyway, something poison. No, no, I, I'm, I'm talking of, of, of the, the, the regulatory authority or the body that regulates the use, the, 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 the registration and the use of the pesticides in Kenya. Yes. We have been working with them. We have been pushing for, for so the, the withdrawal. the Poisons Board. Yes, that's yes. the equivalent. Yeah, yeah, yes, okay. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we, have been, we have been pushing for the withdrawal mm -hmm. of uh, mm -hmm. some of the highly hazardous pesticides. And we are lucky actually in July, and we really want to acknowledge PCB for that initiative because mm. we are able to withdraw um, seven products out of the market. And this will be on a phased out approach mm. up to December 2024. This will be phased out in the market. And we want to really request them to continue this trend because we have over, like, like Sylvia said actually, that our... The, the kind of usage of these pesticides amounts to 76% usage by volume are highly hazardous pesticides, highly hazardous pesticides. And only 2% are biopesticides that we can say are safe. So what we are, we are amplifying mm. is for the PCPB to continue this initiative or with the withdrawal of these highly hazardous pesticides. And this comes to what you said, that kind of interlinkage within our agencies and the kind of um, work we are doing in this country will be supported by some such such kind of initiatives. Coming back to uh, the issue of CALRO, uh, yes, we have got some of these uh, research that has been done, and I'm, I just want to echo these are top-notch kind of research that is being done. Mm -hmm. But does it resonate with our policymakers like yours? Are they are they amplifying this message? Because these are the these are these are the spokes these are the spokespeople of the common one NG. Right. They are people who are hard. A scientist will go to the grassroots, will not be heard as much as the politician. Okay. So we need these kind of result, results, these kind of policies to be articulated, uh, to be articulated in a manner that it will be embraced. These kind of policy issues mm -hmm. will be embraced by our politicians, by our decision makers, by our grassroots opinion leaders, maybe even the church leaders, so that they can be able to get this message. Just to finish uh, this is that we are going to have, um, on the 11th and 12th of October, we are going to have seed and food fair, whereby we are going to really amplify the management of our seeds, the indigenous seeds by our farmers, the kind of food People like Sylvia, safe food that they give us. They are going to be, show, show, they will be showcased at uh, the museums of Kenya. We're inviting the public and as many people to, 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 to attend. These are some of the initiatives whereby the public can be educated. There will be kind of um, amplification of this message to the wider public in a very simple way, in a manner that they can be able to appreciate, they can be interact with these scientists, with this organization, Ministry of Agriculture, Calro will be attending, in, will be host, co-hosting this event with us. So let us, even our politicians, let them come. You know, let us hear what, what we are talking about. We need politicians out of this discussion. <laughs> <laughs> we need them. No, we they are the ones, they are the no, ones no, who no, need no, to articulate no, this to, to the common don't. one. We actually don't. <laughs> yes. We don't. Yeah. Because, yes. remember, they exist because we put them in those positions, in those positions to articulate what it is that is of interest to us, something which they don't do very well. But they can learn from us from such far. Now yeah, you've understood. There you go. You see, we have a situation that is inversed. The politicians should be following what we want them to do. 
if we amplify the politicians, then we will be following what they want us to do. So they should come and listen what we are talking about, so they Precise. can be able to articulate. If you come from an area where you are a progressive politician, thank God on your knees, <laughs> and even fast <laughs> if you can. Okay? <laughs> we throw this term around quite often, even as we talk about policy making and you know interventions for the future. But we throw the term organic around quite yeah. a lot, Sylvia. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and even looking at the growing of food and the eating of food, you mm. know, you just say, "Well, I'm I eat organic." organic okay, I great. Sounds bougie. It sounds so bougie and, you know, grown and sexy and things like that. But what does it actually mean? If we say you're eating organic mm-hmm. food, mm-hmm. what does that mean? So the simple definition is basically to say that you're eating food that has not been um, grown with um, uh, uh, synthetic inputs. So that means the pesticides, herbicides, all those. And uh, food that has been grown, uh, you know, putting into consideration nature. And that's why we have upgraded even the definition to agroecology because we're really wanting to, you know, farm in a way that is able to support diversity. So it's not just having 100 acres of organic cabbages, mm. but, you know, it's basically having, you know, your cabbages that you've planted with beans and you have some trees and you have birds and you have the bees and you have different things that are really supporting nature and also um, consuming also um, um, you know like the animals or meat you know that hasn't uh, been injected with growth hormones and avoiding the use of antibiotics unless the animals are unwell so basically it's just uh, eating safe Mm -hmm. good food yeah do we see that there is an appetite across from retailers yeah to insist mm. on organic food because that's also an intervention that I would see. Do we see that? To say that those who supply yeah. them, if it has not gone through these Good mm. levels. Good question. Yeah. Good question. And actually, I really wanted to bring that up. Like, you know, who is driving the markets? Mm. Is it the producers or the consumers? And I actually feel that um, sometimes, I'm sorry to say, but sometimes we eat what we deserve because what happens is that um, we are pushing to have nice, beautiful produce without any spot or blemish, mm. you know. And uh, because of that, what farmers have done, they're putting in every effort and every input to make sure that that nice shiny tomato will get to you. Mm -hmm. And just know that this farmer, chances are, has two plots. They have the plot where they are growing their own food at home. They don't mind if it's going to be eaten by all the doodos and everything. Mm -hmm. And they have a plot that's going to this uh, the market that is looking very nice. The nice and shiny one. Yes. So what happens is that (coughs) they're the ones who have demanded. Consumers are saying, my food should look like this. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that organic is selling poor quality food that is looking, you know, like disheveled and terrible. I'm not saying that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if consumers would actually stand up and say, I want to know where my food comes from. If you come to my shop at Sylvia's Basket, I can give you the name and the place of every product in the farmer. I know each and every farmer that supplies us. We are really small. We are not able to supply many people. We mm. have a very small family that is, you know, few people who are getting from us. We are hoping to expand, you know, through these forums and all that. But the thing about it is consumers should ask where has my food come from? Who has grown my food? And how do they grow it? And consumers start asking those questions to all their mamambogas. You'll find the mamambogas will be asking their suppliers. Mm. And their suppliers will be going back and telling the farmers, hawataki chakula ya dawa. Mm. we don't want this food that is full of pesticides. Farmers will convert. Is it possible to have food through the country that is pesticide, pesticide herbicide, what? Fungicide. <laughs> Fungicide. Fungicide. <laughs> Free. Yeah. Is it possible? It is. It is. It, On is large we, scale, uh. it is. But consumers have to start. We have to start that movement. People have to start saying. And even you have to make a choice not to eat that food. And even, you know, the thing about it, you know, we are a very small group, as you said, of few farmers here working in a silo. It's true. But the thing about it, if more people would demand for that good food, then you're going to actually push the demand to the farmers. The farmers now will be like, we have to change our ways. And then, because you know the thing about it, when you buy safe organic produce, you actually um, uh, make more farmers grow safe organic produce. You encourage them. So it's us to push it mm. all the way back to production. That people are having the conversation because, you know, the word in, in Kiswahili, Kenyeji, that often pops up. Mm. And so we know that there's the, th- there's the thinking mm-hmm. fundamentally where people understand, look, something that was, that usually it's, it's something that was homegrown, exactly. isn't it? Yeah. That you would take your scraps yeah. from the kitchen and feed your chicken. Exactly. Isn't it? That yeah. goes on quite a lot. Yeah. Is that 
fundamentally sound in what we're talking about that you would have compost i mean i i saw there's a women's group who have compost their yep. worms and it drips water i know here yeah, worm, uh, <laughs> worm juice then they <laughs> throw it into the farm and yeah. the maize is you know fantastic it doesn't yeah. have problems fundamentally you know in our minds like ct started off at the beginning there's that idea that yeah you know we can grow food and the things around us we can use to yeah you know make sure that it's healthy mm -hmm. There's a push towards reintroducing or at least mainstreaming that idea. Mm. And how can we continue to harness that and use it mm. today? I think also we have to showcase, you know, because seeing is believing, you know, we have some very good examples mm. of large scale farmers who are actually, who know, who have shown and actually grown really good food you know like on a large scale and be able to expose farmers and have those concepts you know out there so that people can actually be able to see it but sometimes you know these stories are not out there you know and that's why we need to have platforms where the stories are actually told and people can actually see but mm -hmm. it's actually possible like let me give a very quick example mm -hmm. um i went to kitale mm -hmm. there's a place called mana house and they've been doing yep. large-scale research on actually growing safe maize on hundreds and hundreds of acres, mm. it's happening and it's working, you know. But, you know, those stories are not out there. We don't know about it. Mm -mm. But we need to amplify those stories and actually showcase, you know, the success stories that have worked. But mm. it is possible. Mm -hmm. But you know, the the doubt, real, you know who the real fight is with? Yeah, tell me. Because these fertilizers don't walk from wherever they walk from <laughs> to come to Kenya. Somebody no, they don't. <laughs> exactly. Okay. They don't mm. volunteer to come to Kenya. Mm -hmm. Now, so long as big pharma, big interests, mm. big business is involved mm -hmm. and the influence is as big. I think you are right in your approach in that you are going to the consumer because that is the only bulwark you have against. Because mm -hmm. if the exactly. buying public actually mm -hmm. approve of your product, that's demands. True. That's it. Yeah. yeah, true. Yeah, that's it. It's true. All right. Mm. And, and I just want to come in. Thanks. I want to come in on that element of um, what do we do to create that demand. Mm. Um, I've always been talking about, and I said earlier here, about even our curriculum for our extension officers in agriculture. Right. Let's align it to the, to the concepts of the day and the practice. What Sylvia is doing, what Manor House is doing. Mm. It's happening. Why can't we tailor our curriculum so that the, the graduates we are producing, both from our TVET institutions, our mid-level colleges, our universities, it is not a curriculum that was adopted in the 60s but being developed or being aligned to, to, to the current conventional or industrial agriculture. This has to change. It has to change. Mm -hmm. Secondly, our frontline extension workers need to be supported in a manner that they should be able to embrace agroecology practices or principles and practices and also be able to convey these messages in a manner that farmers can be able to understand. We have seen what Sylvia is doing with her farmers. Mm. We have seen other networks of farmers who are practicing. Can we have that kind of uh, extension, uh, agriculture extension? The other one, like um, we recommended in this report, mm. is about capacity building and knowledge exchange. When you talk about agroecology, it's about local exchange of knowledge. Okay. There's that kind of work within, within, within a cluster. Let's see farmers how they can share this knowledge and exchange. So that at the end of it, we have said it's about 80% of farmers who give us food in this country. Mm -hmm. So these are the farmers who can be able to do this in a small way and give us food. And so to answer your question, mm -hmm. it's possible. It's possible. Because if you're getting 80% of our food mm -hmm. from small-scale farmers... Mm -hmm. These are farmers who Sylvia is working with, other people are working, and who they are doing it. To, you can be can talked to. Form part exactly. Of this exactly. And exactly. they can be able to exchange this knowledge within themselves, within their cluster areas. Let's try and support. This is what Sylvia we are doing with her at Henry, Henry Ball Foundation. Mm -hmm. She's working in a cluster, working with small scale farmers around her, and actually she ends up creating market for them because they can, they can, be, they can be able to offload their food. Indeed. Yeah. Haran Waroi and Sylvia Courier, thank you for being here this morning. I thank mean, of, of course, now more tempted every time you buy a vegetable to ask yourself, where did this come from? Yeah. And then encouraging conversations where we can be safe in terms of what we eat on a daily. It would be interesting to see if by the end of the year that uh, the Poisons Board will refuse some of these uh, insecticides, herbicides, we hope so. fungicides yep. mm -hmm. and all the other sides. Sure. Sure.
<laughs> indeed. <laughs> Thanks for making us your main meal this morning uh, through the day. And uh, Kenya's biggest conversation comes to a close now. Thank you so much for being here. Everybody who contributed as we had these very important conversations. Asante Sana. We'll be back to do it tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. And continue your enjoyment on Spice FM's programming. And I have to remind you, the 7th of October, Spice FM will celebrate its turning four years old. The Gong Hills Hotel is the venue for that from 7 p.m. till later. Later, very later. And uh, we'll be doing that. You have a chance to meet all your Spice FM super hosts and um, uh, have a chance to come and enjoy the music. And where we get to say thank you to you for being part of the conversations, being part of the music, being part of Spice FM since four years ago. So let's do it on the 7th of October. That's this Saturday at the Ngong Hills Hotel from 7 p.m. Come out, hang out with us and have a good time. Thank you for being here today. We'll do it again tomorrow. It's 10 a.m. up your life. This is Newswire. Dennis Aceto. Kenya will now seek parliamentary approval for deployment of its police officers to Haiti after the United Nations Security Council approved a Kenyan-led multinational security mission to quell gang violence to the Caribbean nation. Foreign Affairs Principal Secretary Korir Singhoi said the government was awaiting the nod from the UNSC before taking the matter to the National Assembly. Haiti has been grappling with the surge of violence since the assassination of President Jovenel Moise in July 2021 at its private residence in the capital, triggering calls for a security intervention to complement the efforts of understaffed and under-resourced Haiti National Police Force. The government will set aside